January 9th, 2007, Steve Jobs is about to unveil a product that will forever change the world. This event is absolutely legendary and from start to finish makes for an awe-inspiring 105 minute window into a world long gone. A world before the first iPhone and the massive shift in society and everyday life that would soon occur. The audience reactions to even such simple things that Steve Jobs shows off, like how he naturally scrolls with his finger, this blew the socks off the audience and is absolutely fascinating to watch. So today we're gonna do just that. Hey, how's it going? I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and this is Cola from 91 Tech as well. <laughs> I've wanted to do this for a while, just to go through the first iPhone event and really analyze everything that happened and just have a fun time. Uh, I really enjoyed this. I only cut out kind of the non-essential stuff. There's also a ton of backstory behind this presentation that we'll talk about, especially regarding how the developers were desperately worried about the iPhone demo or drunk watching the event, so this should be fun. Also, yes, new PC, and the plastic is still on it. I'm sure that will bug somebody, but but uh, it's not like fully, fully finished yet. So that, that's why. Without further ado, go and grab a snack, get comfortable, like, and subscribe. You gotta do it for the dog. I mean, come on, subscribe. She's so cute. And yeah, let's uh, begin watching the January 9th, 2007 event, running a length of one hour and 45 minutes. Okay, I think we're set up, so let's go ahead. So good! Okay, immediately can't use that. That is copyright. <laughs> this title card plays for 20 seconds, so. I said I'd watch through the whole thing and I meant it. <laughs> We're gonna make some history together today. So. Pretty hype. <laughs> welcome to Macworld. It was just a year ago that I was up here and announced that we were gonna switch to Intel processors. At this point, he's just talking about the Intel transition. So this is when they switched from power PCs to Intel processors. So far, it definitely would have seemed like a pretty normal event. The minute you saw these lightning fast machines, you bought them. And we've had an extremely successful year and I want to thank our users very much. Thank you for giving us money. Mac selling through all channels, over half of them are selling to people who've never owned a Mac before. I mean, that's good, new users, but I feel like most people haven't had a Mac, so I don't know if that's as big of an accomplishment as he's making it sound. Jim Alchin at Microsoft was <laughs> quoted recently as saying if he didn't work for Microsoft, he would buy a Mac and he's retiring soon, so I've alerted our Seattle stores to keep an eye out for him. And <laughs> Give him really good service. Vista's coming out, and uh, you know our ads with the Mac guy and the PC guy? Those uh, were the best We ads. made a little ad for Vista, and uh, I'd love to show it to <gasps> we're you. We're gonna get like an this. actual ad? Oh man, I'm just gonna let this play out, because it's great. Hello, I'm a Mac. And I'm a PC. Are you going in for a checkup? Well, I'm upgrading to Vista today, which oh, cool. is great, but I get a little nervous when they mess around with my insides. Well, what do you mean? Isn't it just straightforward? Not really. Like a lot of PCs, I have to update my graphics card, my memory. If I want the premium package, I need a faster processor. It's major surgery. I'm sorry about that. Listen, Mac, if I don't come back, I want you to have my peripherals. Oh, come on. PC, you're not good. Oh, speaking of peripherals. Gotta love those ads, those are the best. 2007 is gonna be a great year for the Mac. But this is all we're gonna talk about the Mac today. So the first thing I'd like to do is give you an update. Of course, we gotta talk about iPods music. first. We've got the the iPod, we've got the iPod Nanos. Oh, those were awesome. <laughs> Look at them, so cool. And we've got the amazing new iPod Shuffle. The iPod, in addition to being the world's best MP3 player, has become the world's most popular video player and by a large margin. Really? I'm guessing that doesn't count like TVs or something because that doesn't add up otherwise. So we had an incredible lineup for this holiday season. Now I'd like to tell you a few things about iTunes now. We have sold over two billion songs on iTunes. Two billion songs on iTunes. This event is one hour, 45 minutes. I'm wondering if I should have skipped to the iPhone, but oh well, we're, we're going through it now, so. There was an article recently that said iTunes sales had slowed dramatically. I don't know what data they're looking at. Oh, he's so calling out the media now. <laughs> and what we see is iTunes sales were really up Holy this crap, past year. Yeah. This is what's so crazy is that the iPod and iTunes was doing so darn well for Apple to switch their business model. That was bold. To move from the iPod strategy, that was bold. iPod was an insane runaway success and it was only getting bigger. For them to pivot like like this is, is big. Very much a Steve Jobs move. I feel like most would have just kept making iPods. Growth of iTunes, I'm pleased to report that we have now passed Amazon. We sell more music than Amazon and we are now number four. 
and you can guess who our next target might oh, be. Geez. So yeah, it's crazy to think that iTunes wasn't at the top of selling music at this point yet. As a matter of fact, we have over 350 TV shows that you can buy episodes from on iTunes that we have sold now 50 million TV shows on iTunes. That's a lot of TV. Incredible. The pioneering partner we had was the Walt Disney Company. Everyone still loves Disney, right? Yeah, they're great. We have a new partner joining the Walt Disney Company to sell movies on iTunes, and that is Paramount. Is there anyone who doesn't sell movies on iTunes these days, I wonder? We're thrilled because they have some awesome movies. Let me just show you a few of the titles here that are going up as we <laughs> That Tomb Raider? Speak. Of course, there's a Bob Dylan there. He loves Bob Dylan. All, all six Star Trek movies. So we are going to be moving up to over 250 movies now offered on iTunes. These are getting up as fast as we can over the next week or so. That seems incredibly low. Like, I know it was a new service, but... As of April 2020, iTunes offered 65,000 films. So yeah, they have a few more nowadays. And we had a new competitor this last holiday season. Uh, which was, of course, Microsoft's Zoom. So how'd they do? Now they're trashing on Zoom. And they garnered 2% market share. Uh, iPod had 62% <laughs> market share, and the rest had 36. Oh boy. No matter how you try to spin this, um, what can you say? Wow, talk about shade. You don't hear Tim Cook doing that. <laughs> uh, they created this, this wonderful ad that I'd love to show you right now. So let me go ahead and roll it. show an ad. This is something Apple's always loved to do in their presentations. Oh, it's just, these are classic. I probably can't play the music here, but these were cool commercials. These really were. They were very 2000s, but they were very eye-catching compared to most stuff. Like all the colors, the unique uh, style. Solid ad, albeit kind of the same as all their other dancing ads, but. They took the same dancers and they did some different animation and they came up with what you're about to see. That's pretty cool. Song is fine. The video, pretty darn cool. Honestly, that was pretty good. I haven't seen that one before. And that is an update to our music business. Why does it sound underwater? I'd like to talk about a product we introduced in September. Uh, Apple called, TV. It's called, the code name is ITV. We have a new name for it. It's called Apple TV. You should either go with your code name or you should pick a code name quite a bit, a real name quite a bit different than your code name. So I'll probably stumble and call this ITV five times today by mistake. I apologize. I wonder why they didn't call it ITV. I guess maybe because ITV could be like almost anything. Watch today on ITV. Like it, it sounds like a channel or something. Yeah, you could have the office on your iPod. That was like featured in an episode if I remember right too. Go out and buy a widescreen TV. <laughs> widescreen TV, oh man. Hook up an HDMI cable to their widescreen widescreen TV and they'll use wireless networking to get their content. Yep. So it's really, really easy to use. Man, they really called it back then, huh? That'd be an interesting video. It'd be trying out the first Apple TV and see what you could do with it. I wonder if it even download anything. I don't know. Look at all those MacBooks. Again, PCs or Macs, I just choose the computer that I like. <laughs> so Dude just throws shade like nobody's business. This is the screensaver. Takes all your photographs here. Yeah, those screensavers were like really cool back then, not gonna lie. Actually, my favorite was the old one on like Windows 98 or whatever with the 3D tubes that would go around. Those were awesome. I should react to that next, next Christmas. So let's go into movies here. Man, that UI is slick though. Like for 2007, it's just so simple, but it, it's just, it's pretty good, right? Stream it down and watch it on ITV. I he's saying ITV like he said he would. I wonder how much of this demo is legit because it's loading immediately, which makes me suspicious. Like how quick is this gonna load? He hits better halves. Yeah, like two seconds, the, surely not. Plus it just goes straight to this scene. It's definitely faked, it's gotta be. Huh, that, that's pretty cool. I'd like that ability, freeze time like that. This is great, but I can't play any of it. So it does that so it doesn't burn a hole in your uh, plasma TV there. Yeah, that makes sense. It switches around the picture so you don't get burn in. It's funny, I've actually never owned an Apple TV. I'd imagine most of you probably haven't put music on your Apple TV before, but... So that's what it's like to play music. It's the old, uh, it's the old Canucks goal song. Vancouver Canucks, let's go. They're actually good again. I don't think any of you are going to know who they are, but that's okay. Here's a photo album I made. You made this photo album? Who are these people, Steve? Are these people he knows? So he said, I made an album, so it kind of makes it sound like he might know these people, but I I'm thinking he might not. 
So you get the idea. Faded out too quickly. Gonna have to knock points off of that. Phil Schiller, my neighbor, comes over. Phil, what do you got on your Mac? We got some content we can watch. What do you got up there, Phil? You got any games on your phone? Yeah, I have some uh, a really cool show I was watching and I wanted to show you on your Apple TV. Phil's acting skills need some work. Vitaly's getting excited. He knows what's coming. So we think this is pretty cool. Yeah. Apple TV. <clears throat> This is a day I've been looking forward to for two and a half years. I'll make a couple cuts because he takes long pauses, but I'm gonna let this mainly play out. He's just such a good presenter. Every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. First of all, one's very fortunate if you get to work on just one of these in your career. Apple's been very fortunate. It's been able to introduce a few of these into the world. 1984, we introduced the Macintosh. It didn't just change Apple, it changed the whole computer industry. In 2001, we introduced the first iPod. And it didn't just, it didn't just change the way we all listen to music, it changed the entire music industry. Well, today, we're introducing three revolutionary products of this class. The first one is a widescreen iPod with touch controls. Just listen to that hype. The second is a revolutionary mobile phone. And the third is a breakthrough internet communications device. Less applause there. People aren't really sure what so, that means. Three things. Three different products, wow. A widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. An iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. An iPod. A phone. Are you getting it? Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. It is wild to me. And here it is. <laughs> I love this. I used this in a recent video. I, no. I love this clip. Actually, here it is, but we're going to leave it there for now. So oh, We actually showed it for like a second. Before we get into it, let me talk about a category of things. The most advanced phones are called smartphones. I love how confidently he knew this was going to change everything. There was no question. I don't think he had any idea it would be as big as it did, because how could he? But like, he knew. He knew this was a big deal. And it's just so fun to watch in hindsight. Like, it's aged amazingly well, like fantastically. And uh, they typically combine a phone plus some email capability, plus they say it's the internet, sort of the baby internet in the one device, and they all have these plastic little keyboards on them. Uh, and uh, the problem is that they're not so smart and they're not so easy to use, so. So he's crap talking smartphones because they sucked back then. <laughs> like they were really boring. Regular cell phones are kind of right there. They're not so smart and they're, you know, not so easy to use. But smartphones are definitely a little smarter, but they actually are harder to use. They're really complicated. They are. Just for the basic stuff, people have a hard time figuring out how to use them. Well, we don't want to do either one of these things. What we want to do is make a leapfrog product that is way smarter than any mobile device has ever been and super easy to use. This is what iPhone is, okay? I'm sure this graph is unbiased. So, we're gonna reinvent the phone. Now, we're gonna start with a revolutionary user interface. The result of years of research and development, and of course, it's an interplay of hardware and software. Why do we need a revolutionary user interface? I mean, here's four smartphones, right? Motorola Q, the Blackberry. You notice something about all these? The problem with them 
is really sort of in the bottom 40 there. It's, it's this stuff right here. They all have these keyboards that are there whether you need them or not to be there. And they all have these control buttons that are fixed in plastic and are the same for every application. Well, every application wants a slightly different user interface. And what happens if you think of a great idea six months from now? You can't run around and add a button to these things. They're already shipped. That's a good point he made there. It doesn't work because the buttons and the controls can't change. They can't change for each application, and they can't change down the road if you think of another great idea you want to add to this product. That's well, how do you a solve really good this? point. It turns out we have solved it. We solved it in computers 20 years ago. We solved it with a bitmap screen that could display anything we want, put any user interface up, and a pointing device. We solved it with the mouse. He's almost dumbing it down, like he's breaking it down so people would understand. Well, what we're going to do is get rid of all these buttons and just make a there giant screen. A giant screen. For the reactions. How are we going to communicate this? We don't want to carry around a mouse, right? So what are we going to do? Oh, a stylus, right? We're going to use a stylus. No. <laughs> no. Who wants a stylus? Wait, where's my Apple Pencil real quick? You have to get them and put them away and you lose them. Yuck. Nobody wants a Galaxy stylus. Galaxy Note fans in absolute stylus. shambles right now. We're going to use the best pointing device in the world. We're going to use a pointing device that we're all born with. We're born with 10 of them. We're going to use our fingers. We're going to touch this with our fingers. And we have invented a new technology called multi-touch. It works like magic. <laughs> It's far more accurate than any touch display that's ever been shipped. It ignores unintended touches. It's super smart. You can do multi-finger gestures on it, and boy, have we patented it. <laughs> so, <laughs> that didn't uh, seem to stop anybody from doing the same thing, though. I don't, I don't know. We've been very lucky to have brought a few revolutionary user interfaces to the market. First was the mouse. The second was the click wheel, and now we're going to bring multi-touch to the market. And to this day, I think this is pretty much, like, quick wheel isn't relevant anymore, but the mouse and multi-touch, I mean, that's kind of everything now. And each of these revolutionary user interfaces has made possible a revolutionary product. The Mac, the iPod, and now the iPhone. So, a revolutionary user interface. We're going to build on top of that with software. Now, software on mobile phones is like baby software. It's not so powerful. And today, we're going to show you a software breakthrough. Software that's at least five years ahead of what's on any other phone. Now, how do we do this? Well, we start with a strong foundation. iPhone runs OS X. Yeah. Right away, I can't help but feel like this is very misleading, incredibly misleading, because it didn't run OS X. It ran iPhone OS originally. Of course, iOS now, right? But back then, it was iPhone OS. So yeah, let's, let's just see where he's going with this. Why would we want to run? such a sophisticated operating system on a mobile device? Well, because it's got everything we need. It's got multitasking. It's got the best networking. It already knows how to power manage. We've been doing this on mobile computers for years. It's got awesome security and the right apps. It's got all the stuff we want, and it's built right in to iPhone. And that has let us create desktop class applications and networking. So that's really what this is. You could say OS 10 was kind of like a foundation starting point for them to, to get to iPhone OS, multitasking all these cool things you need. And while it might, in hindsight, not really seem like desktop class, don't forget just how limited original smartphones were. Like they sucked. So this was, relatively speaking, like as close to desktop class as any mobile device I think it probably ever gotten. Not the crippled stuff that you find on most phones. This is real desktop class applications. The second thing we're doing is we're learning from the iPod. Drop your iPod in and it automatically syncs. You're going to do the same thing with iPhone. Syncing with iTunes was a big deal. The fact that this had iPod functionality was a huge selling point because iPods were so big at the time, right? So this, this was really important for them to keep this ecosystem. And it's a good example of Apple in the early days even building up this ecosystem, this network, this walled garden, right? And we do it. We do it through iTunes. Again, you go to iTunes and you set it up, just like you'd set up an iPod or an Apple TV. And it's just like an iPod. Charge and sync. Third thing I want to talk about a little is design. Design, baby. We've designed something wonderful for your hand. Just wonderful. Phrasing, Steve. It's got a three and a half inch screen on it. 
It's really big. It's real big. It's 160 pixels per inch. Highest we've ever shipped. It's gorgeous. That was good back then. Okay. <laughs> and on the front, there's only one button down there. We call it the home button. It takes you home from wherever you Take are. Take me home. And that's it. It's really thin. It's thinner than any smartphone out there. I'd imagine that was definitely true. The fact that they could do this and also make it slimmer than everything else is just wild. And we got some controls on the side. We got a little switch for ring and silent. We've got a volume up and down control. The ringer switch was so smart. They're still around, more or less. It's the action button now, but whatever. On the back, the biggest thing of note is we got a two megapixel camera built right in. Tiny little camera, it's so small. The other side, and we're back on the front. So let's take a look at the top now. The headset jack. Three and a half millimeter, all your iPod headphones fit right in. That headphone jack was inset, by the way, so you could like only use Apple earbuds with it generally. Pretty bad, uh, they fixed that with the next iPhone. We've got a place, a little tray for your SIM card, and we've got one switch for sleep and wake. Just push it to go to sleep, push it to wake up. We've got a speaker, we've got a microphone, and we've got our 30 pin iPod connector. Now, we've also got some stuff you can't see. We've got three really advanced sensors built into this phone. The first one is a proximity sensor. It senses when physical objects get close. So when you bring iPhone up to your ear, it turns off the display and it turns off the touch sensor instantly. Well, why do you want to do that? Well, one, to save battery, but two, so you don't get spurious inputs from your face into the touch screen. Just automatically turns them off, take it away, boom, it's back on. I don't think any other phone probably did this, right? Like, it's just brilliant. And every smartphone would do it after. So it's got a proximity sensor built in. It's got an ambient light sensor as well. Automatic brightness was already around, pretty cool. And the third thing we've got is an accelerometer so that we can tell when you switch from portrait to landscape. So three advanced sensors built in. So you could already rotate with the first one, which is really cool. This is the size of it. It fits beautifully in the palm of your hand. Whose hand is that? So an iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. Let's start with the iPod. You can touch your music. You can just touch your music. It's so cool. You've got a widescreen video, gorgeous album art on this display. Like this isn't a selling point anymore. Like I don't think a lot of people care too much about album art, but back then because displays were so limited, it was a big deal. And so rather than talk about this some more, let me show it to you. Now, ah, yes. I've got some special, special iPhones up here. They've got a little special board in them and a, so I can get some digital video out. And I got a little cord here, which goes up to these projectors. And uh, so I got some great images and you get to see what it really looks like. Before we get into this part, he's gonna start showing off the iPhone, going through the demo stuff. This is where some of the backstory comes in. So at this point, uh, you would think Apple had like a bunch of iPhones ready to go, but they actually didn't. Apparently like you couldn't even ship them normally from China because they were so fragile. An Apple executive flew to China and flew back with the iPhones as carry-on luggage. There were a lot of issues with the virtual keyboard. Touching the letter E could cause issues. Like it was really basic stuff. And of course, getting rid of the keyboard was like hugely controversial. People weren't happy about it, so you definitely didn't want any leg on that keyboard. So this is according to a senior manager of the radios, Andy Grignan at the time. This is a direct quote from him. The iPhone could play a section of a song or a video, but it couldn't play an entire clip reliably without crashing. It worked fine if you sent an email and surfed the web, but if you did those things in reverse, however, it might not. Hours of trial and error had helped the iPhone team develop what engineers called the golden path, a specific set of tasks performed in a specific way and order that made the iPhone look as if it worked. They also pre-programmed the phone's display to always show five Five bars of signal strength regardless of its true strength. This was just in case something crashed, I guess. So they just hard coded it to always show full bars. So what we're about to see here, it's all mainly smoke and mirrors. Like everything did work, but it had to be in an extremely specific order. When he switches phones and stuff, like you'll see, all extraordinarily intentional. The engineers were terrified that things weren't gonna work and they were all drinking during the presentation because it could have been so easily a disaster. And had it been a disaster, I think it's fair to say the first iPhone would not have done nearly as well as it did at least right out of the gate. All right, let's go back now and uh, just remember, he's going to do things in a very specific order or everything will just break and crash. So I got some great images and you get to see what it really looks like. Just push the sleep wake button. And there we go, right there. And to unlock the phone, I just take my finger and slide it across. All right, you wanna see that again? Go to sleep. We wanted something that you couldn't do by accident in your pocket and just slide it across, boom. And this is the home screen of iPhone right here. And so if I want to get in the iPod, I just go down that lower right-hand corner and push this icon right here, and boom, I'm in the iPod. I want to get home, I push the home button right here, and I'm home. Back in the iPod, I'm back in the iPod. 
Now here I am, you see five buttons across the bottom, playlists, artists, songs, videos, and more. I'm an artist right now. Well, how do I scroll through my list of artists? I just take my Watch finger this. and I scroll. That's it. That's the reaction. Just to scroll. You see the momentum too, right? Isn't that cool? A little rubber banding up when I run off the edge. And if I want to pick somebody, let's say I want to pick the Beatles, I just tap them. And here's the Beatles songs with their albums right here. I want to play Sgt. Peppers, I just hit Sgt. Peppers right there. And uh, you know, a little help for my friends. Look at this gorgeous album artwork here. Now I've got a little button up in the corner right here. You can see in the upper right hand corner, I can hit that and flip the album art around. I can't really show any of this because he's got music in the background, so I'm going to get copyright hit. But basically, he's just showing off some of the music features. I just take my unit here and I turn it landscape mode. Oh, look what happens. Man, they really invested time into that music app, didn't they? Like, it's really robust for the first version of software. And again, he's showing a lot of this because iPod was Apple's bread and butter. In fact, it's really the natural evolution of iPod. Stop playing music, it's Steve, please. Simple. I could play with this for a long time. Uh, <laughs> Now, I've also got videos here. I've got a TV show and a movie, and I'd like to just show you the uh, TV show here. This is an episode from The Office. All videos we look at in, uh, in landscape. Now. So, from time to time, I send Dwight faxes from himself, from the future. This has aged really well too, considering how big The Office would get in the binging era of video. I wonder if this part's faked. I don't know. We have touch controls oh, no, it's on not. here, of no, course. No, this is legit. Wow. Now I want to show you uh, a movie playing. Let's play Pirates of the Caribbean, the second one here. Great movie, by the way. Now this is a widescreen movie, so I just double tap and I can see the whole thing here, or I can fill up the screen, whichever I like. I mean, that it, it's wild because that's something we still do today, whether it's a double tap or you know. You gesture to, to blow it up. And again, I've got on-screen controls here. Isn't this cool? So yes. we can be watching feature-length movies just like this. And don't forget, he started this presentation talking about how iPod was the so biggest bad. video player. This is a big deal. And now he's pretty much done with iPod, I think. So when we do the next demonstration, I'm guessing he's probably going to grab a new iPhone. It's the best iPod we've ever made. I was giving a demo to somebody uh, a little while ago who'd never seen this before inside Apple. And uh, I finished the demo. I said, what do you think? They told me this. He said, you had me at scrolling. <laughs> Whole audience right there. It was so novel. I mean, I remember being a kid. When I saw my first touch screen, it was like my dad's iPod touch third gen. Like that was mind boggling. Now, let's take a look at a revolutionary phone. We want to reinvent the phone. Now, what's the killer app? The killer app is making calls. It's amazing how hard it is to make calls on most phones. Most people actually dial them every time. Most people don't have very many numbers in their address book. They use their recents as their address book, right? How many of you do that? I bet more than a few. So we want to let you use contacts like never before. To have a good like contacts app and stuff, like that was big too. We have something that's going to revolutionize voicemail today. We call it visual voicemail. Wouldn't it be great if you had six voicemails, if you didn't have to listen to five of them first before you wanted to listen to the sixth? Wouldn't that be great if you had random access voicemail? Well, we've got it. Just like email, you can go directly to the voicemails that interest you. iPhone is a quad band GSM plus Edge phone headed on that roadmap and uh, plan to make uh, 3G phones and all sorts of other amazing things in the future, so. Right, so this phone wasn't 3G and that was his subtle way of saying that because that was probably the biggest downside of the first iPhone and it's why it's uh, retroactively referred to as the iPhone 2G. It could only do 2G networking. So this is what it looks like when you get a call. This is what it sounds like. It's one of our ringtones you can pick, of course. So. I want to show you four things, the kind of things you would find on a typical phone. So that was the old texting icon, old iMessage icon. Of course, it wasn't iMessage yet because it was just SMS, right? There was no like Wi-Fi texting with iMessage. You see that uh, icon in the lower left-hand corner of the phone? I just push it right here. Note that all the bars boom, are full. <laughs> I'm in the phone and I've got five buttons across the bottom. Favorites, recents, contacts, keypad, and voicemail. I'm in contacts right now again. How do I move around my contacts? Scroll. I just scroll through them. I want to make a call to Johnny I. All I do is push his phone number. I'll call his mobile number right now. And now we are calling Johnny here. <coughs> I could turn on a speakerphone like this if I wanted to. Hello, Steve. Hey, Johnny, how you doing? I'm good. How you doing? Well, it's been two and a half years, and I, I can't tell you how thrilled I am to make the first public phone call with iPhone. That's pretty cool. There he is. 
<laughs> He's using a flip phone. Why isn't he using an iPhone? I guess that's like double the odds of it failing. I remember when we first started working on this and it's just, it's just unbelievable. Whoa, whoa, what is this? I've got another call coming in. Johnny, can I put you on hold for a minute? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I put Johnny on hold and, hi, Phil. Hi, Steve, I wanted to be the first call. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Phil, as you can see, it's put, it's put Johnny on hold and Phil, I can just touch Johnny and bring Johnny back. Hey, Johnny, you there? It's cool how many like little animations and UI things they already had, like, it's just so well done for something that was brand new, never done before. You can see the uh, button has changed to merge calls right there in the middle, so I just pushed that right here, and now I've created a conference call. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I don't remember the last time I got two calls at once, so I don't know if it's that easy anymore. I know, I mean, we have group FaceTimes now, but you could already do this back then. It's pretty cool. And uh, listen, I got to get back to my keynote, so uh, if I want to do that, what I'm, I just touch this arrow right here, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and take Johnny private here and uh, put Phil on hold. Johnny, do you have anything to say on the first phone call? It, it's, uh, it's not too shabby, is it? <laughs> <laughs> and I end this call and it fills on hold. I take him off a of hold. Phil, thanks very much. I got to get back to the keynote now. All right, talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. All righty. <laughs> so, now I've also got a way to make a list of favorites here for my most often called numbers, so I can just touch it once and dial, dial the number. And I might want to add somebody to favorites, so let's say I want to add Phil Schiller, I just push that plus button in the upper right hand corner, right there, and up pop my favorites. It's so funny to me, the contacts and the phone app, like, it hasn't even hardly changed. Like, it's almost identical, really. This is basically the same app, it just looks a little different. Just shows how far ahead they were, like mind boggling. And it's added fill right there, you can see the favorites. I can edit favorites by pushing the edit button in the upper left hand corner. And I can move fill up if I want to, you know, maybe to the top. Tony's changed his number, I gotta update this anyway, so I'm gonna get rid of that and I could just remove Tony, boom. There we go, it's that simple to edit these things. Very, very easy. I've got recents right here, which is all my recent phone calls. If I want to see the ones I've missed, which are in red, I can just go up and touch that button at the top and boom, those are all the ones I've missed. Even missed phone calls being in red, right? Like it's a simple thing, but it adds a lot. If I want to dial the phone, if I'm real last century, I can push keypad here and uh, I can dial a call just with, oops, called four, sorry. Call four. <laughs> Wrong number. Uh, 408-996-1010. I'd imagine the engineers at this point are kind of panicking. And uh, if I want to, I can uh, just keep dialing. Let's say it's a European number. And the numbers just keep getting smaller. Real simple. Very simple to dial with a keypad. Now let me show you visual voicemail. This is so cool. It allows us to have random access voicemail. Go directly to the voicemails we want. So as an example, I come to my voicemail and I say, oh, there's one by Al Gore. I want to hear that one. I just push it. Hi, David. I wish I could be there today. I'm here in Nashville training people to give my slideshow. I don't know Al Gore and Steve Jobs were buddies. Good luck with the presentation. Call me later. Now, if I want to call Al back right now, I can just push that call back button. But I want to listen to one from Tim Cook I've got here. So let me listen to Tim. Hi, David. Tim. I've got the results from last quarter. Revenue was, it, you know, I'll just wait and tell you when I see you in person. <laughs> Good luck on the keynote. I like how much they had, you know, fun with the presentations. And that's awesome. And so I've got voicemail, how I want to listen to it, when I want to listen to it, in any order I want to listen to it with visual voicemail. So that is a quick tour of the phone app. Now what I want to do is show you SMS texting. So I just go to that SMS icon in the upper left hand corner and push it. And I not only have SMS texting, but I have multiple sessions. So I can be carrying on conversations with people, and every time I get a new message from them, I'll be alerted to that, and I can go check it out. So This is another app that really hasn't changed that much. Like, it has, but it hasn't, you know. I've got Eddie Q, and I've been carrying on a conversation with Eddie. That was leggy. Tap this, and here's the conversation I've been carrying on right here. The green bubbles. There's a new message from Phil, and uh, let's see, the conversation was what? Hey, Steve. Hi. Still on for dinner tonight? Absolutely. Your turn to pick. I've picked Sushi Ron. How about seven o'clock tonight? And I say, I can just say, you know, sounds great. And I've got this little keyboard, which is phenomenal. It does error pre uh, prevention and correction. Uh, not that I won't make some, I probably will. But it's actually really fast to type on. It's faster than all these little plastic keyboards and all these smartphones. So I can just say, sounds great. It works. So that right there was like, that would have been nerve wracking this year. This keyboard had a lot of issues, but seems to be working perfectly. And I can send that. Oh, that's interesting. They used to have an old sending animation. And there it is. 
right? It's that simple. And when Phil messages me back, I'll be alerted, I'll see the dot, and I can just go pick up that conversation where it left off. If I want to send a message to Eddie or Scott, I just push this and send a message and go. It's so simple. So that's SMS messaging, and uh, again, you've seen the keyboard, it's pretty awesome. And the third app I want to show you as part of the phone package is Photos. You know, we have a two megapixel camera built in, as I said. We also have the coolest photo management app, certainly on a mobile device, but I think maybe ever. And uh, so here's, uh, here's our photos. I'm going to go into our photo library, and this is our library. And again, I can just scroll through photos here with my finger. Again, who are these people, Steve? Who are you taking photos of on your iPhone? And to go through pictures, I just swipe them. I can just swipe through my photo library. Oh, there's one that's, uh, that's landscape. I can just turn my device and take a look at it. Like those photos gotta be way too good for this phone. So I can even swipe when I'm in landscape here. You know, isn't this awesome? These were not taken by that iPhone. The other thing I can do is uh, I can take any of these pictures and uh, I can make them bigger. I can just take my fingers and I can, we call it the pinch. I can bring them closer together or move them further apart to make it bigger or smaller. And so I can just move them further apart and stretch the image. It's such a simple thing now that is on every phone. But it... I move it around. It didn't exist yet. You know, it's like so many of these fundamentals just formed right then and there. And now... The kid looks happy about it. Now what I can do is I can uh, pick to uh, make this my uh, wallpaper. And of course I could, you know, jigger it around then and just set the wallpaper. And now... Again, whose kid is this, Steve? It's a little worrying. When I wake up from here on out, until I reset it, that's my wallpaper. There it is. Of course, there was no wallpaper on the home screen back then. It was just the black screen. I don't think they even brought that to like iOS 4 or something. So photos, SMS, and the phone app. Next demonstration, he's gonna switch phones again, I'm sure. Get a call, really great call management features. Just scroll through contacts with your finger. All the information at your fingertips here. Favorites, last century. Calling out the boomers. Visual voicemail, calendar, SMS texting, incredible photo app, the ability to just take any picture and make it your wallpaper. It's pretty unbelievable. And I think when you have a chance to get your hand on it, you'll agree, we have reinvented the phone. Yeah, I think that's a good way to sum it up. So. Now, let's take a look at an internet communications device. It's part of iPhone. So what's this all about? Well, we've got some real breakthroughs here. Boy, howdy do they have breakthroughs. Start off with, we've got rich HTML email on iPhone. Basically, you'd be able to display more than just like Times New Roman text in your email. We wanted the best web browser in the world on our phone, not a baby web browser or a WAP browser a real web browser, and we picked the best one in the world, Safari. That's big. It is the first fully usable HTML browser on a phone. Web browsers on anything else would have been garbage. Third, we have Google Maps. Maps, satellite images, directions, and traffic. Yeah, they didn't have Apple Maps yet. They were partnering with Google back then. It's kind of crazy now. We have widgets, starting off with weather and stocks. This communicates with the internet over Edge and Wi-Fi, and iPhone automatically detects Wi-Fi and switches seamlessly to it. You don't have to manage the network, it just does the right thing. IMAP, of course, is the best because you can keep your folders and all your email on the server and access it from anywhere. Yahoo Mail is IMAP. Microsoft Exchange has an IMAP option. And obviously, Dot Mac Mail is IMAP as well. Dot Mac Mail. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> now, I want to take a minute and highlight one. Yahoo Mail is the biggest mail service in the world. They have over a quarter billion users. Wow, crazy. Biggest email service in the world. And today, we are announcing with Yahoo that they are going to provide free push IMAP email to all iPhone customers. Okay, this part maybe didn't age as well, but you know, at the time, Yahoo was big. This isn't just IMAP email, it is push IMAP email, so when you get a message, it'll push it right out to the phone for you. Same as a BlackBerry, so we think this is a pretty big deal. I remember in, I think it was 2009, telling my aunt that she was wrong for using, I think, Hotmail. I had just gotten like a Gmail account at like nine years old, and I was so confident that Gmail was the future. And as it turns out, I was right, so I'll take it, even if I was a little brat about it. So let's go into mail. Guessing on a different phone again. Second icon from the left on the bottom there, I just touch it with my finger, and boom, I'm there. And so I've got an inbox here, and this is, by the way, running live on Yahoo IMAP email. This stuff is coming off a of Yahoo server somewhere up in the cloud. James Vincent here sent me an email, and yeah, he's a proud father. It's taking a while to load. And there we go, and I can just scroll it here. I've got inline photos, rich text email. Let's look at another one. Inline photos, 
rich text. Yeah, even something as simple as that is pretty cool. Directions to Sushi Ron for tonight's dinner. iPhone, of course, parses out phone numbers, and as you can see, there's a phone number in blue. I can just touch it, and boom, I'm going to call this place. Right? I don't really want to call him, so I'm going to end the call here. But you get the idea. And now uh, this last one, Ken Bereskin is uh, one of our marketing folks. He just returned from Antarctica. Ken's a great photographer, and he took all these great photos of uh, penguins in Antarctica. Right in your email, right on your phone. If only the first iPhone could take pictures of that quality. I don't think they've showed like a single photo from the phone yet. I can uh, look at my email with a split view, just like I do on my computer. And so I can select something here. And Yeah, they actually had like a split screen option. That's pretty cool. I mean, I know for email, it's kind of like a standard thing, but on a phone? Pretty cool. And of course, we have a standard inbox and drafts and sent and, you know, and all sorts of folders you can put things in as well. So it's real email, just like you're used to uh, on your computer, right here on your phone. It's extraordinary. And again, free IMAP email from Yahoo. Now, let me go ahead and just uh, create an email message, show you what that's like. So again, when I don't need the keyboard, it's not there. When I do, it's there. I want to send a message to. Uh, Let's say Phil, I just type PH, and boom, Phil Schiller, it's address completion, and maybe I'll send one to Scott Forrestal as well. And there's Scott right there. And uh, let's say the subject is uh, dinner. Funny how slow he is typing with like one finger. And he was saying it was faster than a, than a regular smartphone, which I don't really think is true, but maybe for somebody who wasn't used to it, I'm not sure. All right, now I want to show you something incredible. I love the way he types. <laughs> I want to show you Safari running on a mobile device. So let's go to the web. And here we are. I'm going to load in, uh, rather than apple.com here, a universal site. I'm going to load in the New York Times. It's kind of a slow site because it's got a lot of images. But here we are loading it. We're loading it over Wi-Fi right now. You can see how long it takes to load. I mean, it is still, you know, 2007. So and like just barely 2007 too. You got to have uh, <laughs> some forgiveness. Rather than give you this wrapped version all around, we're showing you the whole New York Times website. And there it is. And guess what I can do? I can just put this into landscape mode, and there it is right there. Don't forget, mobile websites didn't exist back then. So to be able to display the entire website like this was, was so cool because you could do anything on it now. And then eventually, of course, mobile sites would become really common, and now you can do anything on a mobile site like you can a regular site for the most part. It's still loading. Like, it's taking a while. It's kind of funny. This is really great, and I can see the whole page, but of course I can't read it. It's a little too small. So I can get in with my fingers and pinch it, but we have an optimization here. I can just double tap on anything and it automatically fills up the screen with it. And I can just scroll around like this and scroll over here and I can even make this text bigger if I want to. And there it is. Oh wait, no, stop scrolling. I want to read the articles. Something about Iraq. What's happening to Iraq? I need to know. And so I'm just, look at this. There is the New York Times. And again, any article I want, boom. There we go. Pretty cool. Unbelievable. Now, you can look at multiple web pages as well. You can have multiple web pages open. So I just push this button in the lower right hand oh, corner. tabs. Shrinks it down. And I could add a new page if I want. And uh, I'll go to uh, Amazon here out of my bookmarks. This is like really similar to what we have now still. That's pretty wild. So let's go to Amazon. And I love to go to the DVD section of Amazon and see what DVDs are selling. He's showing off Amazon. I'd say they're a pretty big competitor at this point, kind of. And uh, so here's Amazon coming in. Even before the whole page is loaded, I'm just going to double tap on this. and. And uh, I'm going to say, let's go to the DVD section here. And now it's doing that. Like, again, it's slow, but like computers were slow. So this is nothing out of the ordinary. In fact, this would are. probably be way faster than most people's computers at the time because, you know, most people would have had computers that were at least a few years old. And there's a section over here on the right hand side, right there. And these are the top sellers updated hourly. Oh, look, Al's An Inconvenient Truth is number one. All right. And here's all the other movies. And so I've got this right here, and I can go back to the New York Times if I want. No? Let's zoom up to that picture. And it's still loaded, too, which is cool. It's not refreshing the page, right? It's still in the memory, and so is this one. I can get rid of them just by hitting the X. And there we go. Isn't that incredible? Safari. Again, this is really similar to still to like modern safari like it's more limited but it's basically the building blocks right they just nailed the basics everywhere with this thing you know if you've ever used what's called a web browser on a mobile phone you'll know how incredible this is i hope you never really know because it's it's bad out there today and this is a revolution of the first order to really bring the real internet to your phone let me show you some about widgets here 
Uh, let's go to stocks right now and uh, just right onto the phone here. Oh, look, Apple's up. <laughs> Of course, Apple's the only one that went up. So I've got stocks right here, and uh, I can go look at the weather. Let's see what uh, what it's like outside. I'm just realizing he probably switched phones after Safari, right? I didn't even catch that. I bet he did. Paris right here. I can have as many of these as I want, so it's nighttime in Paris. As a Canadian, these numbers are nonsense, by the way. <laughs> well, anyway, here's four places. Hawaii, Aspen, Paris, and San Francisco. And again, the weather widget. To conclude with the internet device section here, I want to show you something truly remarkable, which is... Google Maps on iPhone. This is so funny to me that it was Google. And it shows us North America, and I'm going to go to Moscone West. That's where we are right now. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go uh, look for something. I'm, I'm going to certainly want a cup of coffee afterwards, so I'm just going to look for Starbucks, right? Starbucks. Never heard of them. Must be a 2007 thing. Starbucks. So I'm going to search for Starbucks, and sure enough, there's all the Starbucks. <laughs> now. I can get a list of Starbucks here, so I can pick that one if I want. And I can even go look at that Starbucks. And there it is, and let's give them a call. Good morning, Starbucks, how can I help you? Yes, I'd like to order 4,000 lattes to go, please. No, just kidding, <laughs> wrong number, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. I'm pretty sure that was just some random person, by the way. Like, that was legit. I wonder if they ever, like, knew who called them. That's hilarious. I can zoom in uh, by just, uh, again, pinching if I want to, or I can just double-click to zoom in. So let's go somewhere else here that I've got bookmarked. I love that little pin animation of it dropping. And there's the Washington Monument there. But now I want to show you something else. Satellite images. So I just hit this button called Satellite down at the bottom, and it's going to replace the map with satellite images. There we go. Look how quick that happened. That was impressive. This is the Washington Monument. There we go, look at this, you see people down there. Right on my phone! Yeah, like this, you wouldn't have a Maps app on your phone. Like you would need to buy a GPS, you remember those? My family had a GPS, it was garbage. <laughs> That's as far as we can go with the map, but we can go a little further with the satellite. There's the Colosseum, there's the Roman Colosseum. What do you think, isn't that incredible? What do you think, Cola? I don't think she's that impressed. All these amazing things. This is a breakthrough internet communicator built right into iPhone, and all with Edge and Wi-Fi networking. We're very, very happy with this. This feature set was just so much, like compared to smartphones, if you want to call them smart at the time, definitely far better than they'd ever seen on any phone. It's the internet in your pocket for the first time ever. It's a good line. You can't really think about the internet of course, without thinking about Google. Again, it's funny how much they like kind of worked with Google right away. That would change pretty quickly when Google would develop Android and Apple would move to Apple Maps in 2012. We've been working very closely with them to make this all happen. And it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Eric Schmidt, Google's CEO. Wow, they even had the Google CEO at the time. That's kind of cool. I didn't know that. I don't think I've watched this part before. It's pretty cool to see them like collaborate like this. iPhone was such a big deal, you know? Even Google had to get in on it. You know, I, I've had the privilege of joining joining the board and there's a lot of relationships between the boards. And I thought, uh, you know, if we just sort of merge the companies, we could call them Apple Goo. Um, but I'm not a marketing guy. I like it. What I like about this new device and the new architecture of the internet is that you can actually merge without merging. Steve says that each company should do the absolutely best thing that they can do every time, and I think he's shown it once again today. It's funny to hear Google, like, the Google CEO give Steve Jobs props for iPhone, right? My congratulations to you, and this product is gonna be hot. I mean, compare that to, like, Steve Ballmer, who was, like, trashing on iPhone because it didn't have a keyboard at the time. Steve Ballmer was the Microsoft CEO. Google was definitely ahead of the curve there. Now, you also, can't think about the internet without thinking about Yahoo. It is my great pleasure you see the Yahoo CEO? to introduce Jerry Yang, co-founder and chief Yahoo. Quick, can I go back in time and tell him to adjust his plans for the next decade? Because things aren't going to go his way. I'm not a board member of Apple, but I would love to have one of these too, obviously. <laughs> Wow, all this for a phone, pretty in incredible, and, and what a great device, Steve. We are uh, really proud at Yahoo to be partnering with Apple. I'm going to skip most of this. There's nothing really interesting happening. He's just talking about Yahoo. <laughs> Yahoo uh, is really trying to redesign and re-innovate and reinvent the web experience and the internet experience on the mobile devices. So Yeah, about that. <laughs> just think, it's basically like having a BlackBerry without the Exchange server. This is really going to be really great, a not Blackberry. only having a seamless experience from your PC, taken to your mobile internet. Yeah, I, there's some clapping out there, I can hear that. So we're big believers in great hardware and great software, and we're big believers in taking the web services and the web 2.0 model. Web 2.0, baby. My address, you got it all? 
please send it to me. Thanks again. Thanks, Great Jerry. to be your partner. I like how they're all asking for an iPhone. Like everyone wants one, it's so cool. Good speaker, honestly. It's been great having the two greatest companies on the web right down the block, Google and Yahoo. The fact that these guys were like roughly equivalents back then, oh boy. And it's been an incredible pleasure to work on this great technology and- Where's Bing? I wanna see Bing on iPhone, man. Internet communicator, an iPod, and a phone. Let's put them all together and see what you can do in a real life scenario. I want to listen to some music, so I'm going to go into my iPod here. Again, love to show off the music, right? That iPod element. And let's see what happens when I get a phone call. Music fades out. Screen changes. So I can ignore it, but I think I'm going to answer it. So I'll answer it. Now, it knows who Phil is because he's in my address book, so it puts his little picture up here and everything up there. And, uh, hi, Phil. Listen, I'm kind of uh, busy right now. What can I do for you? There's a photo that you had of Hawaii. I was kind of hoping you could send it to me. Okay. Uh, hold on just a sec. So I push the home button here, and I'm still on the call. You can see the phone thing flashing right there on the lower left. Like, that, that's exactly the same as how it is now. That's crazy. All right. So, I, again, I just go down here and push this button. And rather than use it as wallpaper, I'm going to email it. Compose window will come up right behind it. There it is. Well, that was pretty cool. It was slick. What happened to all those old cool animations, I tell you? I also love the just general design of the skeuomorphism. I think it really got kind of perfected with iOS 6, but it still looks really good, I think. Yeah, I was kind of hoping if you're done soon that we could not only get some dinner, but maybe catch a movie tonight. Is anything you want to see? The fact that he's doing all this while on a phone call is pretty darn cool. Figure out what uh, movies are playing? This is nothing personal here. We yeah. Gotta go catch a movie. Don't want to read too much into it. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Phil. Okay, here's Fandango. Let's just double tap. And how about we go see uh, Night at the Museum? I haven't seen that yet. <laughs> oh, I haven't either. That'd be great. Great. All righty. To go back to my uh, call, I just touch the top here. Go ahead and end the call. And uh, what happens now? So, this is what it's like when you put it all together. Now, how does this stack up? Oh, is he actually going to show, like, how crappy their software well, these is? Are their, <laughs> these are their home screens. Oh, man. <laughs> And uh, again, as you recall, this is iPhone's home screen. <laughs> this is what their contacts look like. This is what iPhone's contacts look like. And again, you just pick one and you see everything about that person, all the information you have. This is what mail looks like on these smartphones. Again, this is what mail looks like on iPhone. Again, Steve said five years ahead of any other phone. Yeah, easily. This is what calendars look like on these guys. Calendars look like on iPhone. This is what the web looks like. And we tried to make it look as good as we could on these. It usually looks worse. And this is what you get. And uh, of course, this is what you get on iPhone. And you can zoom in and see anything you want. This is what you get for music players. Nobody really uses them much. Uh, and this is what you get on iPhone. After today, I don't think anyone's going to look at these phones quite the same way again. Dang, yep, pretty much. I mean, BlackBerry kicked around for a while, but... Got some great stereo headphones we're going to be shipping, and uh, they've got a little addition to them, which is this little thing right over here. It's a microphone and a switch. Those old Apple earbuds, classic. And we also have a Bluetooth accessory. And there it is right there. It's incredibly small. This was like the first AirPod, <laughs> basically. Got one button on the top for answering and hanging up a phone call. You never have to turn it off or on. It just goes to sleep. It automatically pairs with iPhone, so you don't have to worry about pairing. It even kind of looks like an AirPod in a way, but... Very tiny. This is what it looks like in here. I want to get one of those. <laughs> it's just beautiful. It's the coolest one that we've ever seen. It even like has a stem on the ear like an AirPod. That's kind of crazy, actually. I didn't realize how close it kind of was. A lot of these smartphones have pretty, pretty low battery lives. We've managed to get five hours of battery, uh, and that's for talk time, okay. for video, I mean, or browsing. For back then, pretty good. And 16 hours of audio playback. We've been pushing the state of the arts in every facet of this design. Basically. The only real limitation or downside would have been probably 2G networking, honestly, which he's avoided mainly talking about. We've got the multi-touch screen, miniaturization, a lot of custom silicon, tremendous power management, OS 10 inside a mobile device. Again, not really, but sure. Pretty darn good mobile version, though. Featherweight precision enclosures, three advanced sensors, desktop class applications, and of course, the widescreen video iPod. We've been innovating like crazy for the last few years on this, and we filed for over 200 patents for all the inventions in iPhone, and we intend to protect them. Yeah, that'll, that'll work. <laughs> No one will, will make any proper competitor, I'm sure. I think we're advancing the state of the art in every aspect of this design. iPhone is like having your life in your pocket. 
It's the ultimate digital device. Exactly what phones are now, that's crazy. So what should we price it at? What do these things normally cost? An iPod, the most popular iPod, $199 for four gig nano. What's a smartphone cost? Well, they, they say you get the phone and some of the internet with it. They cost somewhere between around $299. You can get them for $199. Palm just introduced a new one at $399 yesterday. So generally average about $299 with a two-year contract. Palm introduced a phone a day before iPhone. Rough, man. <laughs> Talking about getting overshadowed. Now, these phones sort of do music, but nobody uses them for music because they're not very good. And so they end up buying an iPod to go with the phone. We know we sell the iPod. What should we charge for iPhone? Because iPhone's got a lot more than this stuff. Video, beautiful, gorgeous gorgeous widescreen. It's got multi-touch user interface. It's got a real browser. It's got HTML email. It's got cover flow and on and on and on. And this stuff would normally cost hundreds of dollars. So how much more than $499 should we price iPhone? Well, we thought long and hard about it because iPhone just does so much stuff. So much better experience on a call and managing your contacts and random access voicemail for the first time and texting and email and real browser and Google Maps and tremendous iPod and cover flow and video. And what should we price this thing at? Well, for four gigabyte model, we're going to price it at that same $499. No premium whatsoever. $499. And we're going to have an eight gigabyte model for just $599. So we're gonna price it starting at $499. The four gigabyte model did not last very long. Not long after launch, they would get rid of it and put the eight gig model at the same price as the four gig model, I think, and then a 16 gig model as well. In fact, I think they actually made it cheaper. Now, when's it gonna be available? We're gonna be shipping these in June. Yeah, June. We're announcing it today because with products like this, we gotta go and get FCC approval, which takes a few months. And we thought it'd be better if we introduce this rather than ask the FCC introduce, to, to introduce it for us. Yeah, it's also because they definitely need more time to work on it. Like they only had so many prototypes working. No, but the prices, I think by 2008, the prices were like $300 for the eight gig. So it was, uh, yeah, it, it reduced quickly, which means you kind of got screwed if you were a super early adopter. Our partner, is gonna be singular. We've chosen singular. Singular, I thought it was AT&T. Oh, singular is AT&T, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> they were formerly known as singular. And when we start shipping in June, we'll be selling iPhone through our own stores and through singular stores. And it's my pleasure to introduce the CEO of singular, Stan Sigmund. Another CEO guest appearance. It's like a sitcom. You know, Steve and I, first met uh, about two years ago in New York City when he shared with me this vision that he had for this product and actually entered into a contractual agreement without us ever seeing the device or the phone. And that was because of the confidence that I have in Steve and his leadership team to deliver on the vision that they have. And every time I see this, it's just wow. It's just wow. It's really, really cool. You've exceeded my expectations. It's a real honor for Singular to be partnering with Apple today. And I brought with me another company to celebrate in this. And it's a pretty big company. It's the new AT&T. Okay, here we go. <laughs> and this new family will help fulfill the vision we have of wireline, wireless, broadband, and video coming together on one device in the ways that customers haven't imagined. Well, yeah, happened. They definitely made the right call by uh, going for it. AT&T wrote the book. Their quality is legendary. I'm going to include this because I know there's going to be somebody who uses AT&T and has had bad experiences with them. And by Apple with the device. <laughs> this guy's fine. You know, it's only been a couple of minutes. It's just like, it's a long event, man. You get a breakthrough wireless experience. No 3G networking though. Again, that was a bit like a big deal at the time. I know I've mentioned it a few times, but they've been avoiding saying that it's 2G networking only, except for like one little mention. And it's, there's a reason for it. 3G was getting big at this point. So that's why the next year's iPhone was the iPhone 3G. I hope you're as excited as we are. This is going to be a terrific ride. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I appreciate all these speakers like can feel the weight, like they know how big this phone is, right? As Stan said, we started working together about two years ago, and we come from pretty different worlds. The telecommunications industry, the computer industry, and of course music with the iPod. We're gonna bring some great stuff to market over the years together. So, let's take a look at, uh, at this market and how big it is. My clicker's not working. <laughs> Something had to go wrong, right? Something had to go wrong. So how big is this market? Well, let's take a look. No. Alrighty. 
Uh oh. Technical difficulties. Clicker is Man, not working. Man, the whole demo works perfectly. Uh, now, now the clicker won't work. They're scrambling backstage right now. <laughs> this is why Jobs is great. Well, he's probably going to improv something. You know, when I was in high school, <laughs> Steve Wozniak and I, mostly Steve, uh, made this little device called a TV jammer. And it was this, it was this little oscillator that put out frequencies that would screw up the TV. And Woz would have it in his pocket, and we'd go into like a dorm at Berkeley where he was going to school, and a bunch of folks would be watching like Star Trek, and he'd screw up the TV, and somebody would go up to fix it, and, and, it, and just as they had their foot off the ground, he'd turn it back on. <laughs> and if they put their foot back on the ground, he'd, he'd screw up the TV again. And within five minutes, he'd have somebody like this. Well, that's where that comes for from. For the rest of the Star Trek episode. Okay, so maybe it's working now. Maybe they're going to have to click them for me. Game consoles. 26 million game consoles were sold in 2006 worldwide. Actually, a little smaller than you'd think. Yeah, I would expect more, to be honest. But Digital cameras dwarfed oh, it boy. at 94 million. Ripped digital cameras. They barely, they didn't even talk about the camera, did they? Not really. They talked about photos. Who knew that iPhone would become the most popular camera? Mobile phones, just about a billion last year worldwide. So what does this tell you? If you just 1% market share, you're going to sell 10 million phones. And this is exactly what we're going to try to do in 2008, our first full year in the market, is grab 1% market share and go from there. So we're going to enter a very competitive market, a lot of players. We think we're going to have the best product in the world, and we're going to go for it and see if we can get 1% market share, 10 million units in 2008, and go from there. So we've added to the Mac and the iPod, Apple TV, and now iPhone. And you know, the Mac is the only one that you really think of as a computer. Maybe our name should reflect this a little bit more than it does. So we're announcing today, we're dropping the computer from our name, and from this day forward, we're going to be known as Apple Incorporated to reflect the product mix that we have today. Right, OK, yeah, this is when they dropped it, dropped the computer from their name. That's cool. You know, I didn't sleep a wink last night. And uh, I was so excited about today because we've been so lucky at Apple. We've had some real revolutionary products. The Mac in 1984 is an experience that those of us that were there will never forget. And I don't think the world will forget it either. The iPod in 2001 changed everything about music. And we're going to do it again with the iPhone in 2007. We're very excited about this. And you know, there's an old Wayne Gretzky quote that I love. I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. And we've always tried to do that at Apple, since the very, very beginning. And we always will. Wow. So thank you very, very much for being a part of this. Always will. What a line. Steve was such a good presenter. Like, oh, that's it. Okay, wow. Yeah, it kind of just ends. What is there to even say, right? Like, wow. Um, what a presentation. It's, it's, it's just mind boggling. A good chunk of you watching this right now probably weren't even born when this event happened, which is wild. And not only that, but you would be like almost 17. <laughs> So it's not like you're really young or anything. I really enjoyed this. I'm glad we did this. I'm just gonna take a sec and we'll do the outro. And there we go. That's about it. That was awesome. That, it's such a great event. I just, oh man, it, it's so fun to watch in hindsight. And it's just crazy to see how far ahead the iPhone was compared to everything else at the time and how well everything's aged. So many fundamentals of smartphones were invented right then and there. And they've stuck to this day, you know? Like when you scroll with your phone, it hits the bottom of a page or whatever, it kind of bounces. That was there, right? Like. It, it's just, you get the idea. It was, it was a fun event. And uh, if you guys want to see more like this, I, I would actually love to do it. I think it'd be a kind of interesting thing to, to go back and watch old iPhone events. I was even thinking I could like review them. I don't know what I'm going to call this video yet. It might even have review in the title. I don't know. But I did have this kind of idea in mind where we could kind of rank them on a scale of one to 10, five points for impact and five points for just entertainment value. Impact being like, how important is this? So like the most recent iPhone 15, 15 Pro event. It's a big deal because it's an iPhone, but it wasn't really any sort of big upgrade. So that would be like maybe a two for impact versus like the first iPhone would obviously be a five 
or like the iPhone 4 would probably be a 5. As for entertainment, it's just like, well, how good is the event? Is it fun to watch? For that, uh, the first iPhone event would definitely be a 5 as well, which gives it a 10 out of 10. No surprise there, but I think it makes sense that would be the gold standard for any iPhone event to kind of match. As for the most recent iPhone event, if I was to give it a score, I would probably give it a 2 for entertainment, to be honest. I, I didn't enjoy it that much. It was fairly boring, as most are these days, I think. They're just not that entertaining because there's not really a lot to show off anymore because, you know, they, they don't have much to upgrade. So the 15 Pro event, probably like a 4 out of 10. First iPhone event, a 10 out of 10. So with that being said, hopefully this video doesn't get copyright struck. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, maybe hit that like button and consider subscribing for more content just like this. You can follow me over on my socials if you'd like. We also have a great Discord community and shout out to the channel members. As always, you guys are the best. So thanks for watching. I'm Josh from 91 Tech. This is Cola, and we will see you all in the next one.